You guys may not know this, but I had a podcast in the past, and it was a fun thing to do, but it was a challenge to get my podcast to all the locations where everybody listened to podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the such were just a lot of work to manage to get everything where it needed to be. Now, though, I found Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with great sponsors too so that you can get paid to podcast. How awesome is that? Honestly, I'm really happy to find Anchor again because I love podcasting. I love talking about what I do and sharing with you all the things that I like to do as well. So if you're interested in starting a podcast like I am, go to anchor.fm slash start. That's anchor.fm slash start and join today for your free podcast and become part of the community. I can't wait to hear what you put out on anchor.fm slash start. Hey everybody, welcome back to Elevated Office. This is Eric McGrew with Eric's Tree Service. I want to welcome you to Season 1, Episode 6 of Elevated Office. And today, we're going to talk about five ways to make better sales for your tree service company. All right, so before we get into the five ways to better your sales as a tree service company, we are going to do a product review. And the product for this week or this episode really is going to be the new 60 liter notch gear bag. This bag is very, very interesting because um, when I saw it online, I wasn't super I wasn't super motivated to buy the bag just because I didn't really understand all that it had really. Um, I thought it was just kind of like a, a a 60 liter hiking backpack or trekking backpack kind of that you could put your, your gear in. And it is kind of that way, but, um, it's not exactly that it's much, much more. And I'm so thankful that when I attended the Arbor Fest Expo and I was part of the climbing class, they actually gave me one of these bags along with all the other climbing um, class attendants, um, attendees. We all got this bag. Um, I got to say, it's much more than I ever noticed from the photos online. See, that's, I'm going to make a little bit of a, a um, diversion here. Uh, the, the thing about buying online and in the catalogs is photos in two dimensions can only do so much for you, um, explaining what it does and things like that. Um, and I didn't see the, the quality and the design features of this bag online, um, which was a shame because when I saw it in person, man, it was so much different. Now the bag is, I think, $120. So understand it's not like a cheap gear bag, uh, you know, relatively speaking. It's definitely a bag that's a little bit more cash out of pocket. So that for some is a con to the bag, but I gotta tell you, it's it's worth the money in my opinion. Um, I can fit all my gear that I, I climb with regularly and by climb with I mean all the stuff that goes on my saddle either every time I climb or at least you know half the time depending on what I'm doing if I'm just doing a a straight up removal of a pine or something like that then I use less stuff on my harness a lot of times or my saddle versus if I'm doing like a, a cottonwood or an elm where I have to do a lot of limb walking I might use other things or if I'm having to do rigging and stuff like that but what I carry on my saddle 75% of the time, let's just say to give an average between the two, this bag will hold all of that and my saddle can fit down in there. Um, and it doesn't squish my saddle. And on top of that, I can put my lanyards in there that I use. And I can also put my, um, uh, rope bag down in there with my 200 foot of, you know, 11.7 mil, uh, poison ivy. And then 
it has a daisy chain it has two daisy chains actually on the front so i can clip all my a extra carabiners on there um i also use some of the carabiners that i have as extras that clip on the front i clip my um, one of my throw line cubes when it's folded up on there and i also um, have two side pockets on this thing that will accept like my um, captain hook the dmm wells hook down in the side compartments and um, I can put other things down in there if I want like throw bags or extra um, string or rope or whatever. Uh, it, it's got two pockets, one on each side. It's got the daisy chains in the front. It's a material that is, I don't really know what the material is, but it's, it's very resistant to water. It's almost rubberish. I, I really don't know what the technical name for the material is but it's got stiff walls so it stands up straight it's got a sealed bottom and the lid is sealed plus it has a gator inside that cinches like a, a traditional rope bag would um it's got a lot of features that just really make it an outstanding bag the padding on the shoulders is really really nice the only thing i noticed about the shoulders for the backpack when it's fully loaded down the thing gets heavy uh, as we all know and it would be nice maybe in the future if they came up with a chest um, strap to to pull the shoulder straps together to help keep them on your shoulders better but you know I'm not like hiking into the woods with this pack that that's for sure I'm just you know making short distances to the the work site from the truck or whatnot so it's it's very very manageable um, the loop in or the the lid and pocket enclosures are these interesting little clips that go through eyelets and those work really well they really send like they really just um hold on to the the loops really well they don't come off easily and they work as like a a minimal compression strap so overall the the bag is just totally worth the money and super super nice to work with i i didn't know that i would actually use it for a full-on gear bag at first because i was like oh well it's not like a duffel bag i mean you have to open the top and then you have to pull everything out and gr get whatever's on the bottom if that's what you want but i've learned within a couple of uses of it how to organize my stuff bottom to top and I, I really, really like the bag. I like it for days like today. It was snowing this morning and I had to get a, um, I had to work a, a juniper tree that was like, I don't know, 24 feet tall or something. And I had to get all the limbs off of it and get the top out of it. Cause it was the only day a guy could help me on the ground. And you know, the ground was damp and it was snowing and whatever and that the the top of the bag plus the sealed bottom and sides kept everything dry and nice and just yeah I, I really like it I think it's worth investigating so I'll put a link to the um the bag in the description and I definitely suggest that you guys go check it out it's definitely a thumbs up for me on that bag so far so Hope you guys like it too, and please don't forget to go check it out. Alright guys, so to start with the five ways to better your sales on your, for your tree service company, I am going to say respond as quickly as possible to inquiries. Email text, phone calls, whatever. Even when I think a phone call is probably going to be a, a you know, some kind of um, sales call or something, I go ahead and I respond. If you live in cities, then you know a lot of people from out of state come into the state, they move in, they live in the city with an out of town area code. And out here where I live, that's a big, big deal because that was just really not appreciated for a long time in the in the more rural country areas 
And a lot of these companies, if it doesn't have a Colorado or Western Slope area code on it, they won't even answer until somebody leaves a voicemail. And that's something that actually has given me the edge on a number of of jobs. Um, So, you know, my company is relatively new. It's definitely new to this area. And yet... I'm I'm getting booked up every month more and more quickly, which is nice. And a lot of people say it's because I was the first one to answer their call, whereas all the other ones, they had to leave a message and then they had to wait for them. And sometimes people don't call back for two or three days. And I hear all the time, I called a tree service company and they just never called me back. And that is a... A difficult thing. Um, I know from working with other people and speaking with other tree service companies here, what happens a lot of times is they're busy. They they don't get back on the phone, or or they're busy at the moment with a job that they're working hard on and it needs to get done or whatever, or their schedule's just booked up. And then when they get slow on work, they start calling these people back. And they do keep some business going, but they miss a lot of business too because they're not responding in a very timely manner. So one way that I manage this, because if you remember correctly, um, or if you remember what we've talked about before, I not only run the company, but I also work for the company. So I am the climber, the tree service professional, and the sales guy as well as administration. And that gets really, really overwhelming at times. It really does. But one thing that I do to manage a lot of this is I always climb with a helmet on. I always do groundwork with a helmet on because I just think it's the safest way to do it. And I have a Bluetooth system in my helmet that's connected to my phone. And so I can be running a chainsaw literally and talking to my customer because I have a high end Bluetooth system and they hear chainsaw in the background, but it sounds distant to them. So it's not annoying. They can hear me. I can hear them and I can at least respond to them and say, I really appreciate you calling me. I am busy at the moment. Would you mind if I call you back and I give them a specific time frame. Um, not like the hour or the minute, but like this evening or tomorrow morning, whatever. And a lot of times because I actually spoke to them first in person, they will be more willing to give me a chance, even if other companies have responded. And I've won a lot of bids because they said, well, you were super, super on time with answering your phone. And then you were on time with calling me back at the time you told me you would. And they just appreciated that. So it's not always that you are the first one to be able to hash out details and even give them an estimate. It's just that people put a lot of stock in you actually responding first in person through a call to them. And that's a big deal. So one of the the biggest keys I think is being quick to answer your phone and making it possible no matter what you're doing to pretty much answer your phone for that kind of stuff. Now, that's not to say I don't ever miss calls. I do. Um, But there's ways of getting around not having been able to answer first. And we can talk about that in a future episode, but definitely answering your phone as quickly as possible and as frequently as possible is key. That is without a doubt key for a lot of the business that I get. So hope that helps you out. And now we'll go on to the second thing you can do to better your sales for your tree service company. So tip number two for bettering yourselves as a tree service company is something that sometimes we as tree service professionals kind of forget about. We work hard each and every day. We get dirty. We're out there cutting trees with chainsaws. We have sawdust all over. We're getting in and out of dirty trucks a lot of times and that kind of stuff. And we we kind of seem to assume that the potential customer will just understand that we're service people. I mean... 
at the end of the day, when we go out and do the job on their site, we're going to be in service clothes, right? We're going to be in work clothes that are built for durability or safety or whatever it might be. And so sometimes we're rushing to get to the estimate after a job or we're doing this or we're doing that. And while I'm not saying I've never done that, um, I'm not saying I've never showed up to a customer's house in climbing pants and high-vis shirt. You know, I try real hard not to do that. Even if I have to come home, take a shower, change my clothes, and then go to an estimate that was next door to where I just was, unless it's like hours away, I will go ahead and come home, eat something really quick, change my clothes into not like super formal clothes by any means, but definitely nice jeans and a a nice shirt, like a button down shirt or a nice jacket or whatever. And then I will go and speak to the potential customer. And I have been amazed at how many people have told me, wow, I didn't expect you to show up like that. And it impresses them. They, they have specifically told me, specifically, this is not supposition. I have had more than a handful of customers tell me, I am going to go with you because you care about your appearance. And to them, that means something. And that means something to everybody. It doesn't matter if they're living in a low-income area of town or the highest-income area of town. They care about your appearance. Now, this also goes into the vehicle range. So the vehicle that you drive up to the site on to do an estimate does have or make a difference a lot of times. Let's face it, this isn't fair. I'm not talking about what's fair, what's not fair. We're talking about perceptions people have of you and your company. So I drive a 2001 Toyota 4Runner. It's not a awesome vehicle. It's not the most expensive vehicle. Well, it is an awesome vehicle, but that's a whole different story. It's not the perfect vehicle for sales. It's not the cleanest vehicle I have ever owned. It's not a show car. It's not anything, but I keep the outside relatively clean. And, and I do mean relatively, I try to wash it and it gets dusty and it has mud on the sideboards from time to time, but it's not filthy. It has some dents in it, but once again, it looks pretty well maintained. And when I pull up, I have had people say, oh, I expected you to pull up in a rusted out pickup truck. And, and I'll just flat out tell them, no, that's my work truck. And I'll get into that in a minute. But so the, the perception of what they see from you pulling up into their driveway for the first time makes a huge difference whether they feel like you are ripping them off or not. I mean, they have just simply told me that. So this isn't speculation on my part. This is literally life study. I'll give you an example. I had a guy that told me, wow, I can't believe you pulled up in that truck dressed like you are and have the ability to speak to me in an educated way. That's what he told me. And then he looked at the price I estimated him at and he says, oh man, I can't believe this. The other guy came by and he looked like he had just come to my house straight out of a bar and was in the rattiest truck and in ratty clothes. And I thought he was taking advantage of me. But now that I see you offer me the same estimate, I can see he was legitimate. But I'm going to go with you because I like your presentation better. Plain and simple. So... Whether we like it or not, the fact of the matter is that extra effort can definitely make the difference between getting a job and not getting a job. In fact, there's a couple that I did some work for here in the area and they have promoted me heavily by word of mouth. And I've already gotten two or three nice paying jobs off of them besides their own job. 
And one day I was working really, really hard on a job and I was actually not even doing tree work. I was, I was doing metal fabrication work and they were literally right around the corner, but she had a very short time for me to get there and do the estimate or it would have to wait like another week and a half. And I asked her, well, I can't change and come in my you know, my nice clothes, I'm in work clothes and they're disgusting. Can I stop by? She says, yeah, come on over. So I went over. And once again, when I got there, I apologized. Look, I am so sorry that I look like this. I've been working on building a a tree service truck and I'm just filthy. And I really hate to come to your house looking like this. And she laughed and she says, yeah, It's actually ironic because the friend that recommended me told me that you didn't dress like a tree service guy. You were the nicest dressed person she's ever seen come to give an estimate on her job. And you show up like this. Now she understood because we talked about it and I got the job anyway. But it just goes to show how much people do judge whether it's right or wrong. They do make decisions based on our appearance. So it's definitely important to make sure that when we go quote, when we go do sales, we have a professional looking appearance, not tree service professional. We don't want to, they don't care if we look like a tree climber. That's not what they're into. What they're into is that we look like people who are going to take care of their property, people who are going to understand what quality and aesthetic appeal is, and also that we're going to look like people who know what we're doing and have an appreciation for finer things. They do care, and it does make a difference. So is that to say that without dressing like that, you won't make money and you can't stay in business as a company? No, that's not that's not what I'm saying. It just could make the difference between how hard you have to work to make those cells or not. So definitely from what I'm hearing from clients, I think making a nice appearance when you're giving a quote and when you're out doing cells is key to being able to make good money in tree service company. So um, at least easier. If, if that makes sense. So whether you agree or not, I don't know. But I can't go against what numbers of my clients are saying. So hope that helps you out. And we'll continue on now from now. So for the third point, I would like to say that I think this is actually one of the more important ones as well. So please don't misunderstand. These points aren't in a sequential order. They're all important. But the third one I really think is important. And I've had a number of customers also express appreciation for this. And that is communication. Being able to communicate with the customer regularly but not over communicating is always a bit of a challenge for me because each person wants a different thing and sometimes I do want to over communicate to people and that can annoy people I know that I've learned so I'm, I'm learning over well over the years I have learned how to kind of fill customers out because I've done a number of different kinds of um, service work jobs or whatever and No matter what service work or sales work or whatever I've been in, being able to clearly and openly communicate with the customer is very, very appreciated. They want to know when you're going to be there, how long you expect to be on the job, what changes have occurred during the job, and to some small degree, why you've done what you've done. So... For me, it's not uncommon that I'll call a customer, I'll give them an idea of when they might be able to expect me, make sure that's okay with their schedule. Then I will go and keep them updated like the next day or whatever if my schedule changes, if the job that I'm on runs long. I try to let them know sooner rather than later. And if that makes an adjustment in what's available in their time frame, 
Then I talk to them to try to communicate a way that it can work out for me to still do their job and get the job that I need to to get done. It's amazing when you're open about communicating with people like this, often they, instead of becoming belligerent, actually bend over backwards to try to help you out. Now, that's not always the case. Some people are just rude and they don't care about your problems and they don't whatever, but you can't change those people. But I'm telling you, when you communicate with people, most people are willing to help you out and they will even go out of their way to make that happen. I've had customers be willing to use their own equipment to get a job done because they knew that I was doing a really good job for them. I had been, you know, very consistent about communicating with them. They'd seen the hardships I was going through. Maybe the job, I underbid it because I just couldn't see certain factors or whatever the the case may have been. And they know I have another job coming up and they were actually willing to take time out of their schedule and help me out to get the job done. And then they paid me a tip on top of it. I, that's happened a number of times and I'm not bidding like way under average for tree service work in the area. I'm not like undercutting everybody. And then they're like, Oh, I feel sorry for this guy. Let me give him more money. They just appreciate. And one of the things that they say is, the appearance as we talked in the last tip, but also my open communication with them. Once again, it's, it's a fine balance. You don't want to over communicate and things like that, but definitely communicating is, is important. And so when possible, and it's not always possible, especially in heavy tree season, um, it gets a little hairy at times with the jobs that I have, plus the estimates I have to do, plus vehicle and equipment maintenance, plus, you know, administrative side of things and all that. But I try to schedule time for me to be able to actually meet the cust- the potential customer for, let's say, an estimate or somebody who's already considered me uh, or is going to use me, let's say. And I try to take a few minutes and just talk to them about what their scope of their idea is, what the reality of the job is, Um, because it's one thing to give them an estimate, but it's another thing to understand what they expect from what you're going to do. Remember, these people are not tree service professionals. They might have their own idea about what they think should be done, but not understand the realities. And I found that if I just take 30 minutes and talk to them about what the scope of the the job is and what I'm, you know, envisioning happening on the job and the process that I'm going to go through, it clears up a lot of these doubts. And a lot of times they don't get upset. They just readjust their perspective on it. Um, And amazingly enough, a lot of customers have done some kind of research on something. Maybe it's the kind of tree that they have. Maybe it's what they think the cause of the death in the tree might be, or why it may have this or that, or why they decided to take the tree out if it's not dying, or why they feel it needs to be pruned now, or whatever. But a lot of times those people have already done some investigation, and they have decided that this is what they've seen online or whatever, and this is what needs to be done. But when I communicate to them as to what I have envisioned and why, then it seems to help them be at ease. It puts us on the same page and there's no crazy, like out of the blue abnormalities that they weren't expecting. It also makes them feel more comfortable because they can plan their life around you. Um, when, when at the end of each day, I try to communicate with the customer when I'm leaving the job site, what I got done briefly that day, what's left to get done. And I try to update them on the scope of the job from that point forward. I also try to inform customers at the end of jobs, what I found on the job. Like, did I find a limb that had extra 
rubbing or whatever and it was dying out up top or was there hollow spots in it and do they really need to worry about them right now or just keep an eye on them for the future that kind of stuff so communication has been key and now i've got a lot of customers that are saying oh well next year i'll call you back and we can take more weight off that side because we don't want to overcut this year or whatever and it's it's a lot to do with communication now there's another aspect of this and we'll go into that in tip number four and that is teaching so let's get into that one So one of the most important of all, I think, of the five that we'll talk about is good communication and teaching at the same time. So in tip number three, we talked about communication. Definitely listen to that segment if you haven't yet. But teaching your customer in a well-communicated way is important. Don't be dogmatic about things that you've read or learned or whatever. Um, Talking down to people never goes well, even if you are more educated than they are. Don't try to force the fact that you are the professional. They don't like that. It is an attack on their pride, and they usually do not respond very well. But ask questions to them why they feel the way they do about things with a polite and respectful tone. And offer up what you're learning. Don't act like you know everything, but show them that you know you need to learn more. And because of that, you're actively learning. Um, Just spoke to a customer the other day. Got the job. Very happy with the job. We were talking about her juniper. The juniper that I started climbing this morning while it was snowing. And she had a concept of what she had read online. And it wasn't very accurate. I don't know where she got it from, but it wasn't very accurate. But what happened was I mentioned, well, you know what's interesting about that? The International Society of of Auriculture has a study guide for those who want to be a certified arborist. And I want to be a a certified arborist. I'm working on that. So I have this guidebook and I was just reading in that book and I stated a, you know, a point that really contradicted exactly what she had said. But I didn't tell her you're wrong. This is what's right. I just told her what I was learning and she was like, oh, really? That's awesome that you're continuing to learn and that you're always trying to improve your knowledge and this and that and the other. That's who I want working on my trees. That was the point. That was exactly what was needed. She's like, I'm so glad you shared that with me. But if I had said, you know what, you're wrong. And then I told her the right thing. I could have totally been justified in doing that because she was wrong. And the tip or the information I had was newer was correct. Okay, fine. But it wouldn't have gone well for her pride. And that's no way to get customers who are going to refer you. Now she says, not only do I want you to work on my trees, but you're just so knowledgeable and you're trying to learn all the time and I'm going to recommend you to everybody. There you go. So once again, Teaching people is not correcting them all the time in a, in a just direct and dogmatic way. It's helping them see the right way in a way that isn't an attack on them, but yet a way that proves that they might be seeing it from a wrong way without really drawing attention to it, right? And that takes tact. You have to be tactful. You have to be polite. And it, it really does take being humble yourself. Um, now, there are things that I have to I have to just simply stand up for and say, look, I, I, you know, I, I tried to explain it a nice way or whatever, but I just can't do this. For instance, topping. I've tried to explain why topping was bad. And then the guy just wanted me to top the trees and he tops them every 10 to 15 years or whatever. And... I just finally had to say, look, I I really appreciate that you called me out. I really would like to do a good job for you. 
But ethically, for the safety of you and your family, those around the trees, the health of the trees themselves, I simply will not top trees. I don't judge you as a person. I know it's what you've been doing for years. I know it's what your dad and your grandfather did for years. I know it's a common culture here in the area. But as someone who's trying to hold to the ISA standards, I will not top trees. I apologize, but I really recommend you call a different company that will. And even though he was disappointed, he he wanted me to do the work because he had heard good things about it or about my company. In the end, he was very happy with the way that I handled it. And he did end up calling somebody else and he got the trees topped. Fine. I'm not responsible for those trees. He still thinks well of me. In fact, his neighbor said how he thought I was such a polite person and whatnot. Great. That leaves the door open for more work in the future. He has some ornamental trees that he might let me work on in the future. I don't know. But I didn't leave on a bad foot, but I was more direct. But always polite and with tact. And that's important. I've heard some tree guys go out there and they just act like people are stupid. And people don't like that. Just simply. They do not like it. They do like when you can educate them, though, in a polite way. And when you prove that you're being educated as well, that tends to leave the door open for them to accept the education as well. If you act like you know it all now, even though you did go through education to get there, you read books, you went to classes, you did all this, you did all the other, that makes no difference to them if they feel like you think you know it all and you're just trying to teach them. You have to put yourself on a common ground. You have to be humble to make people appreciate it. And it will increase sales without a doubt. Everybody that I've talked to in the industry, when they talk about being able to politely and in a friendly manner, educate their clients, those clients are the clients that recommend you. Those clients are the clients that come back, not just every decade, but sometimes year after year to have fruit trees or ornamental trees or even their big trees pruned because now you've educated them. They understand and they remember you and they promote you. Word of mouth is the best promotion. No matter what anybody says, that is the best way to get more work. And these tips that we're talking about all culminate to that perspective from a client. They want to promote you because of these five tips that we're talking about. Now, there are other aspects as well, but these five tips are really the basis for that. So we're going to get into the fifth tip, which is cleanup. And I'll tell you why that one's so important as well. So for the fifth tip on how to better your tree service cells, we're going to talk about cleanup. And this by far is one of the most important tips I can give, honestly. Um, Recently when I was at the ArborFest Expo tree climbing course that North America Training Solutions was putting on, there was a instructor there, Travis Morales, who owns his own tree service company, um... A new leaf culture, I think it is, in near Destin, Florida. And he we we spoke a lot and, and I really appreciated all the um the experience and the knowledge that all three of the instructors had. Due to circumstances, personality, whatever it might have been, me and Travis probably spoke more than the other two. And I remember him very clearly talking to a group of us and we were talking about different things. And and one of the things he mentioned was you could have all these scenarios and he mentioned a number of different things happen on a job site. And with time, almost every one of those scenarios will be forgotten. But what the customer will not forget is clean up. If you didn't clean up well, they will probably never forget it. But if you did, that's what they will forever remember about the company 
Why? Because whatever scenarios we were talking about, barring like death or some major accident, of course, on the site, um, all the other scenarios with time were just the blip in the, the scheme of the work. But for days after you have left, if you haven't cleaned up well, they either see it or they're out there cleaning up after you. So they remember that that gets burned into their head. And as I've mentioned before, I've done lots of different kinds of service work over the years. And I learned really early on the importance of cleaning up after myself. And you notice that when customers start to make mention specifically that that key feature, the fact of how well you cleaned up after yourself was so much different than all the other tree or not tree service companies, but all the other service companies they had. That is the case with tree service companies. I have had um, a few customers already say, well, in the past we, we had tree service companies come out and they left branches and they left this and that and the other. And we were out here trying to organize them and they took some of them, but they didn't take all of them. I don't know why and whatever. And you guys, you guys organized it all and took it all away. And, and you, you really did a good job. It's almost like you were never here. So they notice and they will tell other people about that. If it's a really nice house, then definitely go the extra step. But I try to treat every customer like it's a really nice house. The the thing about that is, is learning how to clean up each kind of scenario. So out here we have a lot of zero scape areas or we have a lot of, um, you know, mixed scape kind of yards where it's grass and everything and then it's a lot of different colored rock and that kind of stuff. And this is where it gets to be a challenge because of course I don't want to throw gravel through my chipper. That's just not good, you know? Um, but at the same time, I don't want their job to look bad. So I have to buy the right tools and learn how to use different kinds of tools to get the work done. So a rake isn't always the best option. Um, a pitchfork isn't always the best option. A snow shovel isn't always the best option. Sometimes I have to just get a big backpack blower and force a lot of that stuff out of the rock and gravel areas so that it's, you know, not staying there. Whereas if I raked it, then I'd rake half the gravel into their grass or whatever. Um, But I go beyond that. I look around at anything that is specifically near the... um, work area that we're in and if there's like old leaves or or you know out here we have sagebrush that turns into tumbleweed or whatever if there's that kind of stuff laying around I go ahead and pick that up and I get my guys and I do it myself we all clean up that too I mean I don't go and clean up their whole yard but if it was the difference between cleaning up the rest of their front yard and getting more business from them versus cleaning up just quote unquote what we did and them saying, well, now my yard looks half done. Yeah, I'll clean up their whole yard. That extra hour or whatever is going to make a huge difference in their perspective of me. And their friends are going to be like, man, look at how well they left your yard and that kind of stuff. Now, I always do say be cautious about how much extra you do for people It's like the old saying goes, give an inch, they take a mile. And that is very, very true with customers a lot of times. If you start on the path of, can you get that one more branch? Then it becomes taking down a whole tree for free. And, you know, you have to definitely be careful with that. But don't let that get in the way of doing good quality cleanup. And if your guys aren't doing good quality cleanup, teach them how to do it. And if they just refuse to, then you probably need new guys because if they're not willing to do good quality cleanup, they're not doing good quality cutting and trimming. I can almost guarantee it. They might know how to hide bad cutting and trimming well, but that doesn't mean they're doing good cutting and trimming. They're just hiding bad trimming well. So, you know, is that the same thing? No, it's not. Hiding bad cutting, hiding bad trimming is not the same as doing good trimming. That's obvious. So I don't know if this helps you guys out at all. I I can't imagine how it wouldn't help 
you out. You might know most of this stuff. And if you do, thank you for listening anyway. I really appreciate it. But these are definitely five tips that I think every tree service company could put into practice and would actually help them better their cells. So thanks again for listening to them. And we'll get on to the conclusion. So I want to thank you guys all for stopping by, listening to my podcast. Please don't forget to check out ericmcgrew.blogspot.com. There you'll see this podcast and others posted as well as my YouTube videos that I do for off-roading and for tree climbing, tree service uh, reviews and ideas. Some of these same topics will be reviewed in video form there as well. And I do a lot of gear reviews in visual form there. Also on the site, I have a page called the Arborist Tree Climber Store. I'm not selling anything directly. It is a list of products that I use regularly, I think are beneficial, and I think are quality. If one of them starts to become something I don't want to use, I will remove it. So it's an updated list of what I think is good quality stuff that you might be interested in. The Amazon affiliate links on there are, or the Amazon links are affiliate links, which means if you buy something through them, I get paid a very small portion of that. So that helps me keep the podcast and the channels going and my reviews and stuff going. So if you don't mind stopping by and checking that out, that would be great. I really appreciate you guys listening. Thank you for all the support and I'll see you in the next podcast.